Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nikon Creators Hour. I am your host, Mike Corrado. I've been with Nikon for over 35 years and taking pictures for over 40. And we're bringing you some amazing conversations with some epic photographers and filmmakers. And with us today, we have Robin Layton from Seattle. Robin, how are you? Hey, Mike. Good to see you. It's so great to see you. Now, Robin, you are um, uh, uh, an artist, a photojournalist, a filmmaker. You have been nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. Um, you've done so many books. You're an icon ambassador. You've got great projects going on right now. And we can't thank you enough for coming on uh, and, and interviewing with us, spending some time with us in the wake of uh, COVID and the pandemic and uh, sharing some of your work with us uh, over the next hour. But I can't not ask you, how are you doing? How are your loved ones? What's going on in Seattle? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, I've been using this time to um, embrace the stillness and to go inward and think about some things that I've always wanted to create but didn't have time to create. And really what's helping me to get through this time is to be grateful for the things that I have. And I usually am a very grateful person, but especially now. So just trying to rely on my faith and um, get quiet. I do my best creation when creating when I'm quiet. So lots of times to do that right now. Well, I know that to be true of you because you and I have been friends for quite a long time now. And uh, so outside of the, you know, the work connection, you know, we have a great friendship. So it's even more yes. uh, exciting to me to be able to share these oh. stories because I guarantee you I'm not going to know everything about the backstories <laughs> to the photos that you're going to present today. But I would like to start by, you know, talking to everybody out there that may not know who Robin Layton is, is how did you get into photography? You've got a, a, a real journey career. Um, talk about yourself a little bit and how, how you became uh, the photographer you are, filmmaker you are. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so when I was a kid, my mom, she was, she was an artist as well, and she would always make scrapbooks. So we would cut up magazines of you know um, animals in Africa, the draft silhouetted against the sun, and we would just make all kinds of um, pictures into scrapbooks. And so I knew that I was attracted to photography. And one day um, I was looking at a National Geographic magazine and I was flipping through the pictures and I said, man, mom, I'd give anything to take pictures like this, like these pictures. And she looked at me without skipping a beat. and She said, you know, you can do that for a living if you want. And I literally took my hand and I slapped it on my knee on the magazine. I said, that's what I'm going to do. I mean, I didn't even, I, I knew for sure at 15, I was very fortunate that way. And I was very fortunate. I had supportive parents that encourage me to follow my dreams. Um, in fact, everything I do today, and they're both not here, I, I do to honor both of them because they encouraged me to and supported me to follow my dreams. So, so a week later, here I know in my mind, I want to be a photographer and I'm, um, I'm going to my music lesson. I play guitar and the owner of the store was never there, but this one day he happened to be there. And he said, hey, Robin, your teacher is going to be late, so hang out with me. And I said, okay. And so we're chatting, and he says, out of the blue, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, and I said, I'm going to be a National Geographic photographer. And he said, really? Did you know that one of my students' father is a National Geographic photographer? And then right then, I go, really? Right then, the door with the bells, you know, like just like out of a movie. The door opens, and he goes, in fact, here's his wife now. And I'm like, huh? And she just came in to buy strings or something, right? Well, it was David Allen Harvey's wife, right? <laughs> so he knew he's a, a world-renowned National Geographic photographer. And so Sue Harvey came over and he introduced us and she goes, here, here's my phone number. Here's our address. Come on over. Well, they ended up being three miles from me. So of course I called and of course I went over and David just took me under his, his wing and he looked at my pictures. Um, don't laugh, but I shot with the 110 camera. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I remember. You know, they were like the size of a cigarette pack, but um, I took pictures of rocks and ducks and it's funny how it's come full circle now because I photograph a lot of birds now. But, um, and he looked at my work and he would give me assignments like, go shoot that picnic table and bring back the pictures. And so he was very instrumental in my career. And he told me the best school in the country was Ohio University. And um, he called Chuck Scott, who was the head of that school, and said, what does uh, a person need to do to get in? And I had all that you know, information in front of me. And I worked hard on a portfolio. And I'll never forget getting the letter. And I got into school and, and to the Ohio University program. And then when I got there, um, 
you know, also David would tell me stories like, yeah, I'm in a tent for three weeks for get a picture for five seconds. I'm like, hmm. When I got to school, I was like, I don't know if that's me. So I started liking photographing people. And I remember this photographer stopped me on the street and he showed me his portfolio, you know, the slides we would hold up in those blackboards. And he showed me pictures of rugby players and portraits of people. And I'm like, oh, that feels right. Like I know, you know, my whole life is about that feeling you get your inner voice. And so I said, I'm going to be a photojournalist. That's what I want to do. And so that's what I did for school. And, and it took off from there. And I've been very, very fortunate in that, um, you know, finding those moments and, um, creating those moments was a rush for me. So it's so funny. You bring up the black boards that we used to put slides yeah. in because of course, you know, negatives, negative sleeves, slide, slide pages, you know, the, the glass scene, yourself. you know, pages. Yeah. And, yeah. and then I felt so cool. The very first time I put my favorite images into yeah. one of those black, you know, yeah. bordered, um, you know, uh, pages. And, uh, you know, it was like a nice hard, um, cardboard and, and, and yeah. then you present it to somebody and yeah. that's, that's the way you presented your portfolio. Yeah. There was no such thing as Instagram back then. Right. right. You know, and your, whole the mail. Soul, right. your whole soul was on that black cardboard. <laughs> Robin, send me a portfolio, put it in the mail, <laughs> oh. you know. Oh yeah. That's, right? that's how I got it. to Seattle. Yeah. That's how I got to Seattle. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. And, it crazy. Until you, until you got a slide duper, you know, right. You, yeah. you were putting your originals out there and never knowing if they'd ever make it back. Right. Yeah. Um, crazy, yeah. crazy times. Yeah. Fast forward to now. Yeah. But that's amazing. See, knowing you for as long as I have, I didn't know how you, you know, kind of got connected to David Allen Harvey. I did a job with him in Italy once, way back yeah. when, a phenomenal photographer. Yeah. And uh, is there anybody else that's inspired you along the way or helped yeah. you create your style to what yes. it is today? Yes, definitely. Um, and it actually has to do with the first picture we're going to talk about. But um, it was um, a photographer at the Virginian Pilot named Raymond Gaiman. And then mm -hmm. he went on to work for Geographic. And um, the guys that um, I also shot with Bill Taran and Dennis Finley, they all worked at the Virginian Pilot. And that's where I got incredible amount of inspiration and, I guess, training. And that was my second photojournalism job at, at that paper. So Raymond Gaiman really influenced me, not only in um, photography, but in music. He's the one that turned me on to William Ackerman, which I know you know about that story. So he was very influential in my life. We will definitely talk about William Ackerman uh, coming up, and that's a perfect segue to me sharing the screen and opening up the keynote and starting on this very first picture. Mm -hmm. That will come for a screen. A beautiful image, incredible moment. Life is about moments. Um, tell us the backstory on this first image. So I was the newbie, the new person, and the only female photographer um, at the Virginia Pilot, and. Um, I had this assignment, I think I was there four months, and so I had this assignment to go to where the um, people were leaving for the Gulf War. And um, I was a little nervous because, you know, we had a, a bunch of people going and we were gonna have runners to pick up our film. So in other words, back then it was slides actually. So we would shoot a little bit and then somebody would run or, run or would come out and go, give me your film, and then they would take it back and process and we would keep shooting. And I think there was two or three of us at this um, departure. Um, there's a lot of you know, ships in that area in Norfolk, Virginia. And this particular soldier um, was leaning down and saying goodbye to his daughter. Um, and I remember everybody was on top of them, you know, with their wide angle lenses. And I mean, just, and this is a very intimate, special moment, right? And I remember thinking to myself, that's so, that's so rude. Like give the, give them some space. So I, I stood back with a 300, right? 300 to eight. And I kneeled down and I remember it was a little backlit and I went, well, it's a little backlit, but okay. Boom, boom. And, um, and then I just kept shooting. Well, the runner came, but never picked up my film. I don't know why he just missed me somehow. So I, I get back to the paper and they've already picked page one. And I went, oh, okay, well, I thought I had something nice. Maybe I didn't. I hadn't even seen my, my slides yet. And so Dennis Finley, who was there with me, he starts looking through the, the shoots, all everybody's take, and he goes, holy smokes, this is page one. Are we crazy? We missed it. And so sweet Dennis, and this is really kind um, in the photography world, that he, he actually put it on the AP wire. You know, he took it, remember the AP scans? <laughs> and so yep. he, put it, he put it on the wire. And 
Um, next thing I know, Life Magazine has called me and said, hey, oh my gosh, we love this image. Uh, we like to use it on the cover of our um, year in pictures. I think they had 350,000 pictures for this one little um, square on the cover. And I laugh because Bert, uh, Bart Simpson is on the cover. I made it with Bart Simpson. But um, anyway, the editor told me later they had 350,000 images to pick from, which I was really honored. And then um, the phone just started going off the hook. I can't even tell you how many. USO bought it from me. AT&T bought it for me from a major ad. And um, it just kept going. It's in books and magazines, blah, blah, blah. So this picture is um, really special to me because not only is it a um, you know, special moment with this soldier leaving for the war. Um, it's just, I was just proud that I kind of gave it them some space, you know, respected their, their personal space. So. I think there's so many great components and elements within that story, because when you think about, you know, the runners back then, you know, it would say with the press, I mean, you know, it's got to get there first. I mean, timing is everything. So for them to go back through images after a select is made for a cover or, you know, uh, the main image for this story, that's not typical, right? And right. I know, so, it's, you know, yeah. it shows you his integrity and how kind and how he loved his work, you know, and how he loved for talk. I mean, that was really um, way and beyond. I I feel so. Thank yeah, you. for for the y younger audience here, the runner was used to get to you know back to the paper quickly, so they could process the film while you still worked. Um, you know, after this pivotal moment and uh, talk a little bit about your connection. Your camera is up to your eye, right? You're looking through the camera. You see this. How does it touch your heart? Well, of course, it's just such a tender, um, emotional moment. Um, I think for me, um, you know, as, and I'm sure you experience this too, when I'm behind a camera, you could throw a bomb off and I wouldn't know it. Um, that's why I can sometimes hang out of planes and I would never do that if it didn't have a camera. But when I get behind the camera, it takes me into another world. Um, and I'm really in that moment. Um, and it, it was heartbreaking, of course, but um, it was very tender and I knew that it had to be captured. I mean, it was, it said it all, you know, he's, he's leaving for the war. I mean, I might see each other again. So for me, um, getting behind that lens is I just go into my zone and um, yeah, it was a special, special moment to be a, to be a witness to. Beautiful, beautiful image. Let's roll on. Um, I recognize uh, Seattle in this photo. Yes. What's going on this here? It's a great story. Okay. Beautiful sports uh, picture. Oh, thank you. I seem to get my best pictures when I'm the newbie uh, at the paper. Again, I'm the only female um, at the Seattle PI, so at Seattle Post Intelligencer. And I was in Cleveland at the time when the, um, the newspaper called me and said, hey, we're interviewing 15 people. Would you be interested in, in, in working here and send me your portfolio? And I said, yes. And, and I ended up sending the slides that we talked about earlier. And um, they said, get out here right away. And they hired me from, from Cleveland. So I had only been in Seattle four months. And again, the only female. Um, and this was a seven game series. I don't know if you're familiar with the Yankees and the, um, uh, Mariners series when they won the AL West in 1990. Sadly, I am because as a Mets fan, you know, you always oh, hate when the okay. Yankees are in the World Series. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> so, no, well, we're, we're happy here because Seattle beat the Yankees. Oh, there you go. No. Uh, yeah. So, um, so again, I, I'm the newbie and um, every game, my boss would say, let's have a meeting, you guys, because, you know, it probably was like four of us. There was one person at first, second, third, and I mean, first, third, the, um, and then the press box, and then one in outfield. So there's four spots to shoot from, right? I know you know that very well. Mm -hmm. And so I, the first game, it was, um, I was in the press box, like above the home plate. And I was like, man, why, why am I here? Okay, I guess this was the, you know, I'm the newbie. Okay, I'll do it. So I ended up getting the best picture from there because it was Randy Johnson putting his hands up in the air after he did the last pitch. Well, first base had the, arm blocked and third base had the arm blocked. So I'm the only one that got straight on. So my boss is like, Oh, you're moving up. You're going to third base next game. So game two, I'm at third base. So game three, we lost the first three games and now we're going to game four. We, we have to win. No, we lost the first three and we have to win the next four to, to win the whole series. Right. So it's kind of impossible because we were known as the bad news bears. Like nobody went to the Mariners game. Like it was empty stadium. <laughs> I mean, it was the mm -hmm. kingdom, right? I mean, in the sense it had, was a kingdom, it had the, you know, the roof. So it was really, really loud. And, um, and so 
this particular game, um, we had a meeting before, before, as always, you know, and the boss would go around and he'd hand out our, our passes for the field. And after our meeting, he comes up to me and he goes, Robin, you've been doing so well on this series. You're going to be on first base tonight. And I went, oh, wow, okay. Well, the guy who had been at first base the whole series, you know, of course he's bombed, right? Because he just lost the, you know, first base is the prime spot. That is the best spot um, mostly, most times to shoot baseball. So after the meeting, he comes up to me and he says, hey, I really wanted to be on first base. Is there any way you trade with me? And I said, you know what? If it was me, I feel the same way. You can have it here, right? So I gave back the prime spot. And um, we go to the game and, you know, we're sandwiched in on the, I'm in third base dugout, right? Or the uh, press box. And I am sandwiched between, I think like 19 other photographers. I really can't really move that well. And it's just, it's crazy. Well, we, mm -hmm. go into over, we go into overtime, and this is the bottom of the 11th, right? I mean, the Bad News Bears have come into there. We might get to go win the ALS. So we're, <laughs> Griffey gets on, on um, Griffey gets up and he gets on first base. There's two outs. This is the bottom of the 11th. If we get one run, we're going to win the whole series, mm -hmm. right? We lost the first three, four. So I'm on third base, and here comes – so Griffey's on, Griffey's on first. And here comes Edgar Martinez, and he's our cleanup hitter. And mm -hmm. so the crowd's going crazy, Mike. I mean, you can't even hear yourself think. And I remember saying to myself, quick, quick, what have you learned in this moment that's going to help you with, with this? Like, what have you learned in the past that's going to help you with this moment? And I looked down on my camera, and it says, I have taken 25 pictures. As you know, those 36 mm -hmm. in a row right? Now here's Edgar doing his practice swing. I'm like, oh my gosh. So I, I take out the film like, oh, which could be a disaster as you know. And I stick it in my left pocket and I grab the new fresh film out of my right pocket and I put it in, which also could have been a disaster if I didn't load it right. So I'm like, Ch -ch -ch -ch, and I put it in and all of a sudden Edgar goes, goes down third base and here comes Griffey. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Now this is before autofocus, right? We didn't have autofocus back then. This is 1995. It was film, right? And oh, so, follow focus. Oh, oh, not yeah. And not only that, there's different exposures at parts of the field. Like home base, you have to open up a stop. If I remember correctly, it was like 200 to 28, which is not that fast. But mm -hmm. anyway, here comes here comes Griffin. He's running. He's running to second. I'm like, holy smokes! And I'm just like trying to shoot anything I can. And, and um. I felt like a machine gun. You're like, oh my gosh. And, and he's coming around third and he's coming into home plate and he slides into home plate and, he, and the ref goes safe. Well, the crowd just went nuts. So every, per, every player from the dugout like runs out and jumps on top of Griffey, right? And I'm just like, holy smokes. And he sticks his head out from the bottom of the pile and I go, boom, boom, I'm out of film. That was the second to last frame on my role. So mm -hmm. I always say be kind and be prepared <laughs> because I was, <laughs> you know, I gave away that pass and I was, you know, thinking what have I learned in the past is going to help me in this moment. And um, mm -hmm. that picture is truly a very, very special and dear um, picture. It was voted best sports picture of the decade here in Seattle. And, um, you know, Beautiful. I'm really proud of it because it was not a, I don't think I could do that picture now without autofocus. And um, I don't know. It was like, I always equate it to like, standing on a grease bowling ball when you're doing film and sports and um mm -hmm. and not even you know film so much but back then without the autofocus that was that was a tough tough thing so the next day i came into the the newspaper of course it's page one and my boss is elated it's on t-shirts it's on sweatshirts it's a cover of a book and yada yada mm -hmm. so that's a very um i'm kind of known in seattle like a girl took that picture i'm like yes <laughs> mm -hmm. so um kind of known in seattle for, for that image well, I, I know I'm not going to be the favorite person in New York for those Yankee fans, of course. But again, we defend our Mets and anybody that beats the Yankees. So um, I know a few people that would agree with that. And some people that are looking at me right now saying, just close your mouth, Mike. <laughs> um, but beautiful moment. And again, I, I love all of the, you know, the things, you know, from that time period that you're talking about, like no, no autofocus. That's not the way we shot. Um, the yeah. moments, the, the, again, it's serendipity, call it fate meant to be in that right spot because again i think it's it's often said to you know find different places and locations to be different but you know to make that swap for that pass to be in that perfect spot you can't ask for more um and just uh, beautifully done
I recognize the person in this picture. What a beautiful dog. Um, I know you have a, vlo a love of, of animals and, and pets, uh, dogs. So talk about this. Take it away. So um, I had been photographing uh, personal um, events for Oprah Winfrey and, you know, here and there, like Sydney Poitier's birthday party, um, her opening of own network. Um, so personal things for her along the years. And um, she actually um, had one of her CEOs hired me to go to her house in Montecito, California to photograph her and her dog. Well, actually to photograph her dogs, not her. Um, and of course, I'm just so beyond excited. This was before the dog book, actually. And mm -hmm. so um, I went to the house and I was there about an hour and a half and I'm in the, on the grounds and I didn't really see her, but I was just doing my thing, photographing the five dogs all over, their, over her property. And she came out about the last half hour and, um, you know, said, nice to see you, blah, blah, blah. And then I said, listen, do you want to be in any of these photos? And she said, no, this is all about them. I said, okay. So we walked around the property. I kept photographing the dogs. And then I was, she goes, okay, thank you, Robin. And, um, and I was looked at her and I said, listen, are you sure you think that I've gotten everything? Because when you get these photos, I want you to look at these photos and go, oh my gosh, that's Sadie or that's Luke or that's um, Sonny and Lauren. And she goes, hmm. She thought about it a second. She goes, well, come on inside because I, I think Sadie in her bed would be a good photo. That's where she lives. And I'm like, okay. So I had never really been in her house in Montecito except for the, the foyer. So I'm in her kitchen and um, all of a sudden, like I get Sadie's picture. She goes over into Sadie and she puts her nose to nose with Sadie. And I don't, I am not, this is all natural light available. light. I, I hardly ever light anything. I'm Miss Naturel. And then um, she goes over to Luke. Um, and, I'm just like sliding around on the kitchen because I'm then she goes to the other side. So I have to slide around non obtrusively, right? And in Oprah Winfrey's kitchen. <laughs> and I mean, I'm not doing anything. I'm just witnessing what she's doing. And I get down and I see this image of her about to kiss Luke. I'm like, oh my gosh. Well, I missed the this picture in the first edit because they're actually kissing each other, which is crazy, right? And then they're both their eyes are closed. Um, and I missed it in the first edit. So I went home and I'm driving away and I thought, gosh, I think I, I think I got um, some nice images today. You know, you never know, right, until you see them. And so I make a phone call to the woman who hired me, uh, Lisa, and I said, Lisa, I think I did a great job. And she goes, well, I want to talk to you about doing a book. And it was ended up being a different book than the dog book. But anyway, we ended up landing on Let's Do a Dog Book. And that's how a letter to my dog came about. But um, so I get home and I, you know, I edit. And then I, I said, something told me, go back, go back and edit again. And I did, and I found this picture. So cut to, I mail Oprah. Um, I'm, I'm really into packaging and creating little gifts and little books and leather books and all kinds of things and cards. And so I mail her I, everything I've ever created in my life. It must have been like 10 gifts in this beautiful uh, presentation. And so she got it at like 5.30 um, on a Friday, I'll never forget. And she called me for the first time. And she goes, oh my gosh, this, this is crazy, all these pictures. And she could not stop talking about her and Luke because her and Luke had a really special bond, more so than the other dogs. And she goes, that tongue, that tongue. And I'm still trying to get over the fact that Oprah Winfrey's calling me on my cell phone, right? And, mm -hmm. and um, it was just a lovely, really long, long uh, conversation. And um, a few months later, she, um, it, the, the, the picture, she agreed to have it be in the book. I had already shot the pictures. Um, and then shortly after that, she invited me to her ranch in Hawaii and I spent a week with her and photographed Hawaii and created 20, she has 24 pieces of mine, um, in her ranch in Maui. So, um, this picture really, I mean, it's framed in my office and she actually, um, I remember the day I got her, a letter in the mail and it was a, just a green envelope. I have it actually framed behind me and it has an Oprah stamp on it. I'm like, wow, that's wild. I wonder who has an Oprah stamp. And it was a handwritten, um, letter from her. Uh, thanking me. Uh, and of course, that's framed right below the picture of my office. So yeah, that's a very special and dear picture because of my love for dogs and how much I respect Oprah and what she's done for the world. And, and then again, another moment. So mm -hmm. well, you're both uh, two amazing women. And, you know, oh, when cool. was it the first call that you got to go over it and uh, that first shoot the first experience you had with her? And, and, and so how did how did she end up getting connected with you the very first time Did someone just saw your work and said, well, you know, call Robin. 
she, I think I met her in 2004 because, um, I don't, Colin Cowie, he's an event planner to the stars. And, um, he, Oprah gave away her when she had her show, she gave away, it's called the million dollar wedding. And so, um, she said to Colin, hire whoever you want. And so Colin goes, I know who I want. And so I was asked to photograph the million dollar wedding. And so, you know, I met her for the first time and I guess she really, really liked my work. And so she kept hiring me for personal things. Like she gave 1,200 people to go to Hawaii for a vacation. And so she hired me to cover that. I mean, that was probably one of the hardest weeks of my life that I've ever worked. Um, and so we, I had this, you know, rapport with her. And um, and so I kept doing a couple projects a year with her personally. And then, um, you know, I, I hadn't been to her house but a couple times in Montecito. Like, and then I started shooting um, images and projects for own her Oprah Winfrey network. They hired me to um, do projects like that. And, I photographed really, really a lot of fun people for that. And so, yeah, it was just something that had evolved over since 2004. And, you know, it's funny. um, She has called me seven times. And when Oprah calls you, you count. (laughs) Um, And recently, yeah. So it's, it's been, um, it's really bizarre to get emails from her and calls. And I got my first text the other day. And so she's just a really great person and a warm person and really just a lovely person. So. And, and just, that sense of you talk about like when she called you for the first time, how you felt, you know, uh, you know, overwhelmed. What was it like to walk in with a camera for the very first time in her presence? Oh, intimidating. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to lie. It was very intimidating, but you know, you just have to realize that you're there for a reason and you know, you belong there. And um, I think a little bit of nerves is really good. I mean, if you go in there and don't have that, I think it's um, going to be a disaster. And I mean, you, you know, for me, it means I really, really care. So I do better. I think it's a lot of pressure. And I think, what, you know, I think I do better that way. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing the story to that. I know about this picture. I know the story. <laughs> I know about hoops. Um, this is a big, big project for you uh, and yes. not one that uh, happens with one photo. And again, I, I guess this is the point in time it reminds me to apologize to you for asking you to cull down all of your beautiful images to just uh, what we're going to see today. But this was a big project that took you some time and it ends up in a book. Talk a little bit about this. So um, I have a dear, dear friend who lives in New Jersey. And this is before the internet um, times. Um, we went to school together. And as, to keep, as a way to keep in touch, he was a photography major like I was. A way to keep in touch, we started sending photographs made into cards to each other. Like he goes, let's do it once a month. I'm like, okay. So um, his, his name is Andy. So Andy and I start every, every month sending um, handmade cards of personal pictures that we shot, right? And mm-hmm. one year, I got five different basketball hoop pictures. And I said, Andy, you've got to do a book. You've got to do calendars. You've got to do something. These are crazy great, you know? And he goes, nah, I don't really want to do it. And I'm like, okay. So mm-hmm. 10 years goes by, 10. And I'm photographing dog uh, pictures for my dog book and I'm in Ohio in the middle of this field and it's a snowy snowy day and there's this hoop at the end of this cul-de-sac and this is all these trees around it and I go wow that's pretty cool and so I take one foot out of the car and I go click and I look at my image and I'm like oh this is awesome and so I get both feet out of the car and take some images and literally I called Andy from that spot right there in the middle of this field I said hey you remember that basketball book I kept telling you to do and, and, you know, cards and whatever. And he goes, yeah, I go, I just shot a picture of a hoop. Would you mind if I did it? Would you mind? And he goes, absolutely not go for it. He goes, um, just take, just show me what you can do. And I said, okay, I just want you know, I know we're friends. That means more to me than, than this, but then, than a book, but I just want to check in with you. And he goes, yeah, please just go for it. Show me how it's done. So I was addicted by that. I mean, I was, I had what you call hoop eye. And so I couldn't go anywhere. I still today will be in another state or city or even in my own city and say, oh my gosh, like I noticed them. It's hard not to notice them. And so I didn't even have a book deal. I I thought, you know what? I'm going to go for it. I literally rented a van and had one of my best friends um, go out to New York. We started in New York and we zigzagged all across America to 35 states no book deal, right? And I'm funding this thing. It's, it's expensive. We have both have our own hotel rooms. Where, you know, it's food. It's gas. It's a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, we even got to go to the White House, which is a whole other story. Um, 
And so I just thought this has to happen. You know, I, my goal was to go to unique basketball hoops in America and then find, find childhood hoops of famous players like LeBron James, Shaquille O'Neal. And then I wanted to interview them about their hoop. And um, I just knew it had to happen. And I actually did. And um, it's a very, probably one of my best, besides my like book, this was probably my most favorite project I've ever done. Um, it mm -hmm. was just so fulfilling and just was like a treasure hunt across America, you know, mm -hmm. and um, it's been really well received. And, you know, who hasn't thrown up a ball under a basket for a game of horse or, and I think basketball, everybody goes, why basketball? Did you play? And I said, well, in intramurals, but I think for me, it spoke to, um, you know, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take in life, right? A lot of the philosophies and quotes we hear around basketball kind of resonated with me. And then I thought it was a challenge to make unique pictures of just a ring and a net really in a backboard, right? So from this picture I shot on my back in Cleveland. Um, there's a kid playing out. It was a gray day. And I just laid on my back literally under underneath um, the front of the hoop. And um, this, this picture just kind of came together. So um, I'm just really happy about this project. And it was truly, truly fun for me. When you, when you go back, I think there's a great lesson for everybody tuning in uh, that you went back to that original photographer with all of those hoop pictures and, and had the courtesy to say, hey, do you mind if I do that? I think that's an amazing thing to do because not many people would do that. They would just sort of take off on their own and maybe consciously or unconsciously just start a project. And, and I love the fact that this starts off as a personal project. And I, I, I don't want to understate the fact that when you're moving from city to city, the costs alone in oh, hotel yeah. and food and travel and gas, yeah, two, you know, when yeah. you're not being backed, you know, as yeah. a project means there's a huge heartfelt yeah. commitment to this. And uh, you're right. If you're not there to take the pictures, you know, um, you know, they're, they're just not going to happen. And I, I find that fascinating, but I also want to tap into along the way, then this idea grows into what I think is just genius. Sorry, but I, I love you. And I always have. And, and, but this is the genius part is that, let me go back and photograph, you know, the yards that the professionals played in, the hoops, you know, that they played on as kids, yeah. which it just humanizes the professional basketball player because you say LeBron James, right? Larger than life, the king, right? right. And, and yet you don't think about that little hoop he played on long before he was ever the king yeah. of basketball. Right. Uh, he's LeBron James, the kid in a schoolyard, possibly. Um, right. What inspired you to kind of go in that direction? Well, you know, for me, um, I don't, in the, uh, I'm sure you know in the back of the book, there's pictures of, there's 31 players that um, gave me quotes and stories, and the stories are amazing. They just blow me away. I mean, I had the old school Elgin Bay Baylor up to LeBron. You know, I had old school new Oscar Robertson. I wanted some, I wanted a diverse group. I wanted men and women. And so it was ended up being 16 men, 15 women. And so to mm -hmm. honor them in the back of the book, I've asked them to give me their youngest picture they have of them um, playing basketball or, or, you know, with a ball. And I, there's a picture of LeBron at three. Um, and the reason I did that is I wanted to inspire kids. Look, look, these guys were kids once too, and they followed their dreams, right? That's why it's called Hoop the American Dream. The American um, Dream. Yeah, because, you know, they had a, a dream and they followed it and look at them now. And so I wanted to show them that they were kids once too. So that's why I put the youngest picture I could find in the back. And then when it says boys and girls, those are, those are actually doors at a um, boys and girls club in Washington, D.C. And when I saw the doors, I took pictures and that's when I started the bios because they were boys and girls, you know, one time. So mm -hmm. when, when you get this idea, just again, to kind of fill in some of the puzzle pieces, do you start to reach out to the athletes? Do you reach out to publicists? I mean, there's got to be a process in which you right. reach out to find that right. early childhood picture of LeBron James or any of the other, Oscar right. Robinson. Well, um, I actually was connected to some um, pretty well connected basketball people. And then it was just like a chain, a domino effect. You know, they introduced me um, to um, uh, Michelle Marciniak is one of my friends who used to play for Pat Summit. And she was dialed in. And so she would start introducing me uh, to other players. And then, you know, then I got introduced to Rick Barry. And then Rick Barry introduced me to Jerry West, his um, wife. And Jerry West's wife just really helped me she was like reached out to Shaquille and everybody else for me and 
And so it was kind of like every time I would interview someone, I would say, hey, if you were me, who you interview? And I think some players are really bummed they didn't make it to the book because they, you know, they would either say no or whatever. But, I, you know, I asked, but I don't think they realized what it was going to be, you know, because I'm sure mm -hmm. they get asked all the time. And then as far as the publishing, um, I almost self-published it. But at the last second, um, I think I reached out to 25 publishers and they all said no. And so you got to persevere. And um, finally, Powerhouse Books, which is if I had one publishing company to publish my book, it would be Powerhouse. They are the art wing of Random House. So all the art books are done by them and they're actually in Brooklyn, not far from you. And so when they said, Oh my gosh, we want to do this. I was doing the, you know, the dance around the office because um, I just knew this had to happen. So it's a lot of believing in yourself and knowing in your heart that it has to happen and just keep going, just keep persevering. Mm -hmm. And this is followed by then a bunch of public appearances and promotion of the book and, oh, and all so of the things that. that you have to do behind it to get uh, create yeah. that awareness of, of yeah. this beautiful piece. And again, highly, highly recommended. Really, really, this is, this is great. These are great, great stories. And um, oh, I, I, I can't not smile <laughs> when I look at this picture. I know we both have our love of uh, winged animals, um, yes. uh, creatures, uh, as well as many other animals. But to see the above, below water, I mean, you know, you don't see you know, this uh, yeah. a lot. But yeah. Talk about this picture. It, it, it looks amazing. And where is it taken? What's the backstory? Oh, here? Yes. Okay. So, um, I li am fortunate enough to live across from Lake Washington and, um, for 10 years I've been photographing, you know, I'll see a pretty sunrise and I would, you know, click and 10 years ago I'd make a little folder on my, on my hard drive, the, the lake. And um, I just kept shooting here and there. And um, all of a sudden, after about five years, I'm like, gosh, wouldn't it be cool to do a book? And I'm like, mm, I don't know. That's, that's a lot of work. And, you know, I've done, but this is, this is my fourth book. This would be my fourth book. And so I just kept shooting, right? But then I started getting addicted. You know, when you get in that frame of like, oh, my gosh. Well, about two years ago, I was walking along the lake. And I said to myself, it's time. And I turned around. I'm like, who said that? And this voice goes, are you crazy? That's a lot of work. And I'm like, no, you have to do it. <laughs> and so I'm like, you know, fighting this inner fight within myself. I'm like, no, it's time. Well, then I was on a mission for the next year and a half. I thought, okay, you've got four seasons to really you know, do this. Cause I had a, you know, I had a lot of pictures I love, but I, I hit it. And so for the next year and a half, I was so focused <clears throat> on it. Well, then I started thinking, okay, if you're going to do a book on the lake, you got to get in the lake right and i'm like oh no because my friends i was fortunate i have some friends that have boats and um sometimes some summers you go out more than you you know do sometimes you don't and and so this particular friend um invited me to go on the, her boat and so i said okay and i'm the kind of girl that doesn't want to get in the water for whatever reasons now i'm addicted to it but i was like oh my hair is gonna get all messed up and i have you know crazy hair and and i don't know what's in the lake blah 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 so i'm like Robin, you, you have to. So we go out on the boat and then I see these ducks. They hang out with, um, you know, the people that hang out in this cove in Seattle. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I have to get an underwater housing. I have to get in there. Well, you know how I I'm on the boat. So I'm like the next morning, this is a true story. I went to a, um, uh, I guess I don't forget what they call, but they sell these underwater housing at this special camera optical uh, store and um, I went in there and I go, I have to shoot pictures in two hours underwater, in the water. Can you help me? <laughs> he goes, well, what kind of camera do you have? And I said, well, I want to shoot the D850, one of my favorite cameras of all time. And he goes, um, well, you, you know, we have to order this. And every underwater housing, I don't know. In fact, it's actually behind me. You can see this monster mm -hmm. thing. But every underwater housing for people that don't know about them are made specifically for a camera, right? Because you have right. the dials on them. Like you can't just stick a you know, five and you know, um, you can't stick a Z7 in there, right? Because it, it's really made custom to hit all the right. Because the, the buttons are in certain places, yeah. and everything in controls are right. different so, for each right. of the cameras. So and so, I go in there. It's a little intimidating to to put this housing around your camera, and you have to get the pressure and the air. And I mean, it was a lot. So I am so laser focused on this guy. He goes, "Well, you're not going to believe this." How about you? I have one here. Do you want this one? And you know, it was like an $8,000 investment, right? And I'm like, I'll take it. Can you show me how to use it in an hour? Because <laughs> I got to be on the boat in an hour. He goes, uh, okay. And so he's like going like this. I'm like, holy smokes, right? And so I, I don't know how this happened, but I, I, my friend goes, come on out. And they picked me up at the dock. 
and I've got this big thing like, what is that? Right. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to do it. And <laughs> I get in the water and then this happens. And I, you know, first of all, you know, just the exposure, cause you can't, you know, you can't really see it's not lovely like the Z6 and Z7 now, right? You're just kind of putting an ISO priority and you're just, you mm-hmm. know, you're just praying. Um, and so now I'm addicted, right? I just, you can't get me out of the water. And so one of my favorite things to do is split water shots. And um, I'm really proud of this picture cause it took a lot of courage for me because I don't really, I didn't used to like to get in the water and now I'm totally comfortable in there. So it was kind of like a personal achievement slash a new way to shoot. And now I can't get out of the water. So uh, it was life changing for me. It, what you just said about being in a store and this housing is $8,000. <laughs> there's something in the, the psyche here that all of a sudden you say to yourself, money's no object. The project is far more important. Getting this camera in the water is far more important. But that, that speaks to a lot of photographers out there that, you know, like you say, uh, uh, it's an $8,000 investment. I think that's a great way to look at it. But you probably didn't even think about the $8,000 until you slowed down and had a chance to say to yeah. yourself that night, dang, I just bought an $8,000 housing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's specific to this camera only. Yeah. But that's, that is what it takes to make unless you get a cheaper bag, which – they tend to not function well. It's not easy to function, yeah. you know, the different yeah. controls. And, yeah. you know, to, to, for everybody out there, these controls are so precise to each of the buttons. Everything is perfectly right. aligned from right. playback right. to shooting and setting and, 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 and setting the menus and such. So it just brings back that. I wish <laughs> there was a name for that feeling you have that all common sense goes out the window <laughs> and you just yeah. You yeah. forge on. But it's a great thing because at the end of the day, when you make the picture, Yep. That feeling inside takes over everything, and there's no doubt that the move you make is the the, the right move at that point because totally. now it turns into even uh, the bigger project. So you, how long have you been working on the lake now? You said 10 years? Yeah, um, yeah a little over But 10 now years. you're a little more focused, no pun intended, on a project in a book, which, you, listen, you can say it because you've done a number of them. Um, it's the one fear of me taking that huge step into doing a book when people, do a book, do a book, do a book. And yet it's a lot of work because it does consume a lot of time and mm-hmm. takes away a lot of time from shooting. Right. Yeah, it does. It, it's a, it's a commitment. Like it's your full, it was a full time job for me. You know, it's a mm-hmm. lot of getting up early. It's a lot of going out late in the evening. You know, it's all about the light, right? It's all about that early morning light or mm-hmm. dusk and, and um, you know, everybody else is sleeping cozy in their, you know, their beds when it's, you know, 30 degrees out and it's either raining or snowing and, and, mm-hmm. you know, you take a chance. Is it, is it worth me getting all my gear on and, you know, making sure the dogs are taken care of and put them away and um, running out the door? I've got to make sure my gear's all charged up. I got to re- make sure everything's kind of ready to go, grab and go. And um, it, sometimes um, I would go down and it wouldn't be anything. And other times, like this morning, this particular morning, it was incredible. And um, you remember that um, Klondike guy on the Rudolph um, – uh, cartoon around Christmas time, and, he, and he's digging for you, the gold. You, he, Yukon he Cornelius, yeah. I think yeah, his name goes, was. Yukon yeah, Cornelius. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he licks his finger and he goes, nothing. And sometimes that's yep. how I felt. I got nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, so this particular image um, was early morning, and it was one of those magical mornings. These are called coots, C-O-O-T-S. Mm-hmm. They're not really even a, considered a bird. I don't understand why, but some kind of waterfowl. Um, by definition. And um, th- there's two reasons that I have learned just from being out in the water why coots take off like this. Um, one is an eagle is going after them. Two, um, there might be a beaver in the water that's trying to get to them. So mm-hmm. I had, whenever I see them, most of the time they're just kind of hanging out in clumps, right? Um, so I would say 95%, maybe even higher, they're just hanging out. Well, in this mm-hmm. particular morning, um, they would fly a little bit and then slow down and fly a little bit and slow down. Well, I saw a beaver. So I thought, okay, you gotta, you gotta hang with this. You gotta, you gotta keep working this. Um, and so that's how this picture actually happened. Um, little sh- slower shutter speed to show some movement. Um, but yeah, when this picture happened, I knew, holy smokes, it's one of those mornings where you're like, this is too good to be true mornings mm-hmm. <laughs> because mm-hmm. everything was coming together. Um, it was just one of those magical blue hour mornings as well. And um, it was just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful day 
but it's it's these days that carry you through the days where you're not making as many pictures where yeah. I just go out. It's funny, I, I can associate with this because I, I would, for years, and, and it slowed down a little bit, um, especially now in the wake of COVID, and, and it's turned into my backyard, but there's a lake out in Stony Brook, New York, and, and that's, you know, I used to go to the lake with, the, you know, the kids and family and just realized I mean, there's a lot of birds here, and I would go back on my own, and I think several things start to happen is you start to lose time, right? You lose a sense of time because all of a sudden two, three hours go by and you're waiting and you're patiently waiting and you realize that you make this commitment. It's like I almost habitually had to go back to that lake. And I, it's funny because I say lake and my cousin Charlene always, you know, reminds me that it's a pond. It wasn't a lake, <laughs> but, yeah. but you become obsessed. It's like it becomes a part of your anxieties and your DNA. And again, that, that gut feeling of, I can't walk away right now because I may miss something, you know, right. Um, right. you know, exactly. since, yeah. since the pandemic, I go out in my backyard and four hours can disappear like that. Um, yeah. because I'm sitting there, you know, at first I started indoors and then I worked my way outdoors and just, it, it all builds and grows. So, so talk about, uh, you know, a little bit more about, cause I know we, we have a few more pictures here from the lake. Right. And, and that, you know, it just keeps going on. Talk about how you sustain, you know, and, and keep going in a project like this uh, and, and fighting, you know, those days yeah, when you can't make is. a picture. It is a lot of um, self, um, self cheering, you know, and pushing, you pushing yourself. Um, you know, for me, um, I love what I do. I mean, I, I always say, you know, purpose, passion equals purpose. And I feel like, um, you know, photography and art is my purpose. So when you have so much passion, you know, even when I'm on vacation, ha ha, I'm always working. And I don't say work, but I'm always shooting. I can't not stop. I mean, it is what I do. It's in my soul. It's in my heart. It's Robin. And when you have such passion about something um, and such love for something, it it's just it's the drive. It's the drive inside. And yeah, some days you're like, oh, I'm too tired or, you know, it's freezing out. Of course you're going to have days like that, but it's that inner voice that, you know, this could be the day that you're going to get something phenomenal. And for me, that's the rush is what if, you know, what if today? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's funny. I walk around the lake now and sometimes I'll have my camera with me because sometimes I walk my dogs and it's too hard with them pulling. But, um, I just look at the lake now and I go, I am so glad I, <laughs> I did this book. You know, mm -hmm. it was, it was a long journey. Um, and the, it's been very well received and I'm just so grateful that I had the, the opportunity and, you know, to do it. So, but I would just say, I'm just so passionate about it that that's where the drive comes from. Mm -hmm. And, and I love, I love this that every time you go back, you learn something more about the environment and you learn something more about, in this case, the waterfowl or the bird you were yeah. photographing. How much research do you go back on the downtime when you're not at the lake and do you study the behaviors? I mean, you see things happening right there that you pick up. Do you go back and study this and, and, and do a, some a research? Little bit, like a little bit, like I wanted to learn more about these birds, these, you know, what they, were, what they were about. And yeah, sometimes I do. And I think for me, what I mostly do the research or studying is my images. You know, mm -hmm. I'll, this is not like you just go out and go, click and I got it. Yay. You know, yay. This is a lot of, as you know, trial and error. This is a lot of, Hey, studying what I did today. How can I make this better? You know, my motto in life, Mike is in anything I do, whether I'm making a tag for a gift or a birthday present or whatever I do is how can I make it better? Should I put a double, another piece of paper behind it and lay, you know, layer it and maybe do this. And so I'm always looking at my pictures going, how can I make that better? And I think, mm -hmm. That for me, you know, this picture, you know, in 10 years, I have one image like this. It's not like I have 50 of these and I can just pick one. I mean, this is a special morning and, um, you know, and just being there at that time, you don't, I don't know where they're going to land. They're, this lake is 20 miles, 21 miles long. It's not like I have a little lake behind me. This is like, <laughs> this is a freaking huge body of water, right? So you, mm -hmm. you never know what you're going to see. So um, I think just studying your images is important and learning from them and I'm constantly learning I've been doing this for many years and I think that just keep just keep trying just keep shooting you know and you'll start evolving sure. your style and see it beautiful I love this image the simplicity the peace <laughs> and talk about the peace and all this too because there is something nice about being out there alone and feeling oh. just that peace the serenity yeah. of it all 
you know? Yeah, whatever. it is. It, it, this is, um, so I had been shooting, um, not far from where this was taking for the day. Right. And I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm just like, oh, it's one of those, you know, come on, keep pushing yourself. And I'm, I got out of the water. Well, it's cold. You know, you're in the water and you're, you've got your body temperature where you want it. But then when you get out, you're, you're, you're cold. I don't care what the weather is outside hot. Cold. I mean, if the weather is hot or not. And so I look to my left and I see about mm, six geese hanging out. Well, I've never photographed geese before in the water. Like I didn't know how they were going to react. So I start slowly swimming over, you know, with this, this huge monster, um, not a cam, um, underwater housing were on my camera. And, um, of course they took off. And so I'm like, just wait, just wait. And then they started like took, taking off, meaning swim away. And then all of a sudden I just was patient and they started coming back and getting used to me coming back. And this picture is, um, it's, I have one frame, um, and there's a little droplet on my lens. That's why there's a it's little slightly impressionism, which I love. Um, mm -hmm. and it was just a quiet moment. And you know, my mom, bless her heart. She used to say to me all the time, did you know that geese mate forever? <laughs> and when their spouse dies, they don't get another partner. Right. And so all I could hear is my mom saying geese mate forever. You know, they have one partner. And so this picture is called together forever. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, it's just for me, I love that it's monochromatic. I love that it's, um, very simple and clean. And so that's why this was chosen for the cover of the book. Yeah. Oh, so beautifully, beautifully done. Um, I love this picture and I want you to talk about this picture, but you mentioned Will Ackerman earlier, um, in our discussion and a huge project that happens out of this Lake book project. Yes. It just continues to move on and something you've done this year. Um, talk about the picture, but then talk about what you did with Will. Okay. Um, so this was another um, five o'clock morning um, assignment that I gave to myself. It's the triathlon and it happens once a year in Seattle. I had never personally been, but a friend told me, you got to go shoot the triathlon. And I got there early and for some reason the race was started late. Um, it was supposed to start like at, I don't know, six or six 30. And they said, Hey guys, there's a, there's a problem up the road. So just why don't you get in and just get warmed up? Cause usually they all just run in. Right. And so this was getting there early. I know you, I'm sure you agree with me when you go to events or the best pictures usually are at the very beginning before it starts mm -hmm. or after yeah. it ends. And so, um, this was a before picture. And so these are just people getting their you know, suits warmed up and just kind of getting ready to start the race. And then they actually got out and started from the shore. So I was really fortunate that the race was delayed. So that's what this mm -hmm. is. Beautiful. Uh, you know, to, to uh, go to a, uh, something as said by a fellow ambassador, Corey Rich, get there early, leave late. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, That's so what you gotta uh, do. It, you can't just, it's yep. pretty intense. Let me bring you back to uh, full screen. So talk, talk about what you've done with Will Ackerman, because I think it's important. And then I want to make sure everybody knows where they can see this work, uh, all of your work. Uh, and um, and follow what Robin Layton does. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so since I was 21, I was a fan of William Ackerman. He is a guitar player. He's a Grammy-winning guitarist, and he is responsible for Wyndham Hill Records. I don't know if you guys remember New Age Music with George Winston, and um, they had Wind Wyndham Hill samplers. So I was 21 and I got turned on to this music and I just really resonated with Will Ackerman. I would put it in my Walkman. Yes, I had a Walkman back then. <laughs> and I would take pictures. Like that was my Zen space, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I said to myself at 21, gosh, I'd give anything to see this guy play live. Like anything, right? But we didn't have internet. Like how are you going to find out, like, you know, find him in the newspaper? I didn't need newspaper 21. <laughs> and so um, cut to about two years ago. Um, a friend of, I had made a friends with this guitar player and he gave me a CD and I turned it over and it said produced by William Ackerman. I'm like, holy smokes, you know, Will. So I got introduced to Will. He actually came to do a concert a mile from my house. We met before the concert. We instantaneously, it was like two artists just coming together. And so we became friends and, um, you know, we would email and I'm like, oh, this is so cool. I, you know, it's like, pick your favorite musician, Mike whoever you would just really admire. And then all of a sudden you're hanging out, right? I'm sure you, you probably are. I know you shoot a lot of musicians, but so I'm, you know, just 
just really, really becoming close to this beautiful person. So in the back of my mind, um, I thought, wouldn't it be cool one day to play a concert and have Will Ackerman play live in front of my videos? And I thought, wow, I've just, I've been shooting videos when I shot stills of the lake. So I have both, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so wouldn't it be cool if Will Ackerman played live in front of my videos and then maybe for the first hour I would present my lake book with pictures and talk about how this project came out. So long story short, I got, um, I, I actually asked Will to do it and he said, absolutely. I don't know what you're talking about, but I love you and I love your work. I'm in. So I started calling around Seattle and I found, um, after 10 calls, um, the third call was from Benaroya Hall and he's like, look, I don't think this is going to happen, but send me a PDF. And so I sent him a PDF and two months later he goes, they said no. And I said, wait, 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 look at this film I just did with Will's music and my footage of the lake. And then I'll, I'll accept that answer. Uh, you know, I didn't say it exactly like that, but I said, just give me one yeah. chance. Give me one chance. And he goes, all right. Well, two days later, he wrote me back. Well, 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 things have changed around here. They loved it. You're in. What date do you want? I'm like, so I kept yeah. writing and going, is it, it's happening? Like, I couldn't believe it. Like, I had to call him. Like, are you telling me right now that I'm going to be at Benaroya Hall? I mean, that's where Seattle Symphony plays, right? And he goes, yeah, you've got it, November 21st. So, of course, my name's up in the marquee, um, and which is crazy. And it says, Robin Layton presents the lake with guest appearance, <laughs> Will, William Ackerman. And I mm -hmm. called Will, and I go, Will, are you okay with this? He said, you know what? This is your show. I'm there to support you. And it mm -hmm. truly, it, it sold out. It was the biggest night of my entire life, is for sure. And um, something that I just, when you're on your deathbed, one of those moments that you'll be, wow, you know, one of those big mm -hmm. moments of my life. So it happened six months ago. No, it's, it's beautiful. And I'm so happy for you because, again, we've known each other a long time. And, you know, when you call me to tell me these things, it's just always such a great call. And, and, and again, I can't thank you enough for, putting together this collection of images and telling us the backstories because it's so important, you know. Uh, I think uh, it's so great to create content that's inspiring to people. And, you know, when you just see the picture, I don't think you get a great sense. Of it. It's a good picture. It's not. It's an impactful picture. It affects people or it doesn't. And, you know, they love it or they don't love it or they don't feel it. Um, but then maybe they do. Maybe it's something that's so special. Um, I have one special picture hanging up here of yours of the Cocker Spaniel out on the road. Yeah. Um, uh, that I can look at every night and realize I'm at peace looking into that dog's eyes. And, and you sent oh. me that picture a while back. So it's so, so important. Um, so thank you for sharing these stories and calling down me. your collection to just a few here. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for giving us your time. It's much, much appreciated. Thank you so much for having me. Great bir mm -hmm. early birthday present. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I will say too that um, on my website under films, you can see that a nine minute highlight from the, the event I did at Benaroya Hall as well. So. That's robinlayton.com. Yep. And your social handle is Robin Layton. Yep. And just Beautiful. go to films. So, it's, the first, it's the first film under films on my website. Beautiful. So check out Robin Stills, check out the films. Um, thank you guys for tuning in and sharing this time with us. And we hope, again, everybody's uh, healthy, happy, and safe. If you were inspired by Robin, go out to your lake, go out to water, go out and buy an $8,000 housing or something <laughs> to just do a job to, to create some images that you may have not created before. And as we start to break out of the pandemic and sort of get to sort of semi-normal uh, here, uh, we hope you were inspired enough to try something you never tried before. We can't thank you enough for tuning in. For Nikon, I am Mike Corrado with this Creators Hour interview with Robin Layton. Thank you guys so much. Everybody be safe and we'll see you soon.